Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 Virtual Crop Management Conference. My name is Philip Alberti, and I am a commercial agriculture educator with the University of Illinois Extension. Today, I'm going to talk about hemp, focusing on various hemp production strategies and research efforts across the state of Illinois for both cannabinoid and grain and fiber production. Please keep in mind that as a new crop to Midwestern agriculture, best management practices and varietal performance of industrial hemp have yet to be determined. And so this information is intended as a baseline until better recommendations can be given. Today, we're, we are going to take a look at the following topics, an overview of the 2019 and 2020 growing seasons, updates in hemp research in both grain and fiber and cannabinoid production here at the University of Illinois. Throughout the presentation, you will also find information from land grant institutions across the country as more information is available every day. I would like to highlight the development of the Midwestern Hemp Database Project, from which a great deal of information presented here today will come from. And we're gonna talk more about that later, but it's available on our website with the link available on the slide here. So what is hemp? Cannabis plants can be classified as either industrial hemp or marijuana based on the THC concentration. Hemp growers are required to grow cannabis plants which test no higher than 0.3% THC to comply with these regulations. It is critical to understand the rules and regulations regarding hemp production and compliance testing in a quickly changing landscape. Cannabis can be grown for food, fiber, and flour, depending on the production system in place and the end product. There are monoecious and dioecious hemp types out there in addition to photoperiod dependent and autoflowering varieties, which we're going to talk in greater detail about later on. In 2019, the first year of production in Illinois, there was a lot of interest across the state to grow industrial hemp, and nearly all of that was for cannabinoid production. Official numbers from the Illinois Department of Agriculture show that there were 601 official, uh, officially licensed hemp growers and 146 licensed hemp processors. And at the end of the growing season, we saw that 7,100 acres were planted and about 5,200 acres were harvested. If we fast forward to 2020, we saw increases in both growers and processors across the state. And while we do not have production information for 2020 at this time, um, we can expect the numbers of growers to go up from 2019 to 2020. And we will likely even see average production acres per grower and potentially even total acres decrease. These trends are no different than those seen across the country according to Pan Exchange and Hemp Benchmarks. For example, if we look at the numbers out of Wisconsin in 2019 and 2020, their second and third year of production respectively, the numbers of growers and processors has held steady from 2019 to 2020. The cannabis plant produces many naturally occurring compounds such as cannabinoids and terpenes, which are found in the resinous flower of the cannabis plant. The cannabinoids are often the primary molecule of interest for hemp production and examples of common cannabinoids include THC, CBG, CBD, CBN, and CBC. Profitability of hemp producers are often expressed in the dollars per percent CBD per pound. And while CBD has primarily dominated the market, other cannabinoids such as CBG and CBN have begun to receive more interest in the last year. As such, the production practices and harvest systems in place will have to reflect the final product, whether that's biomass for extraction or higher quality flour. Terpenes are the other molecule, molecules of interest that are often associated with the smell of the floral material. Uh, primarily about 13 of these terpenes dominate the market and can vary a good deal according to variety and source of genetics. Cannabinoids and terpenes of interest may impact planting and harvest schedules, and we're going to discuss more about that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on. Many laboratories will be able to perform analysis to determine the amount and type of terpenes in your plant material and will be issued with a certificate of analysis shown here, although these are often going to be uh, separately uh, tested from the cannabinoids. So make sure you are aware of what's being tested in a full panel uh, from the laboratory of choice. Uh, Pre-plant considerations are incredibly important. Uh, before planting hemp, before even getting a license, there are some things I think growers need to consider. And I'm gonna use examples and experiences from the last two growing seasons to help illustrate this. Uh, the reality is this is a high value crop that can spoil easily. And so there are things that should be planned well ahead of time. You know, these are things like, what is your end use? This will likely impact how you are planting, how you are harvesting, uh, if that's gonna be hand or mechanical. So again, we're talking about, is this biomass or high quality flour? 
you know, where are you drying? Hang, hang drying of these plants requires thousands of square feet. I wish I had a better metric for you uh, on that. But, you know, if you're thinking about growing an acre of hemp, uh, where are you going to hang uh, an acre of Christmas trees? So the things that you really need to consider and not just where are you drying, but how are you drying? You need to get the flour or biomass to a stable moisture as soon as possible. Uh, to pre preserve trichomes and prevent cannabinoid conversion and decarboxylation of your material. So keeping in mind how you're storing, uh, not a lot, of, not excessive heat, and we're going to talk more about that later on. Also, we're harvesting these materials typically in October or November, maybe even December in some cases uh, across the state. And so you're going to have a lot of moisture that you're going to need to remove from the floral material. How are you storing? Is this going to be done in super sacks or fiber drums? Are you using polyurethane bags? If so, keeping an eye on moisture uh, and storage conditions are going to be very important. And lastly, and probably most importantly to a lot of our growers is where are you processing? And hopefully you have a processor lined up before you even plant uh, your hemp. But keeping in mind transportation costs um, and long-term storage, will you need to hold on to this material for a long time? These are kind of the big big things I think growers really need to consider before uh, taking a leap and growing industrial hemp. The University of Kentucky has put together a great hemp enterprise budget which is available on their website along with a ton of other good materials. The University of Kentucky has been ahead of the game in uh, hemp production research and so they are a great resource for you to check out. Uh, this budget is easily manipulated to fit your needs for any production system and you're able to input market and uh, input costs to accurately reflect your production system and potentially uh, profitability. In addition, the University of T Tennessee at Knoxville has put together a budget similar to that of the University of Kentucky and I have found that combining these two budgets will give you a good idea of the input costs required to grow industrial hemp. Importantly, market value of CBD hemp has continued to decline rapidly since July 2020 sorry, since July 2019, as production increased dramatically across the country uh, and increased demand for these products has not been reflected in the price sheet for our producers. There are many factors to con consider when making variety selections, including the end use, um, again, biomass or high quality flour, what are the state and federal relation, uh, regulations, and if any interstate commerce will be conducted, how that might influence your decision making. And the environmental profile, where are you growing and what are you growing? Is this indoor, is this outdoor or in a greenhouse and some sort of combination? Um, these are all important factors to consider when we're thinking about that a lot of these uh, varieties, we just don't have a lot of information about whether um, they've uh, been produced or where they're, how they're going to perform in different environments. Uh, as discussed previously, important terms to understanding cannabis would be the difference between uh, dioecious and feminized varieties. Where dioecious populations contain both male and female plants, a feminized varieties contain uh, a vast majority, if not all, female plants only. This is important as the development of dioecious production systems have recently emerged in the market. Uh, dioecious production systems produce co-products such as grain and of fiber in addition to cannabinoids and are planted at a much higher population than in a feminized system. These production systems are still new, they require further study, uh, but for those of you interested in learning more about that, you can find that information on our website um, and the title of the presentation was Direct Seeding CBD Hemp in a Row Crop System, which was a collaboration between Purdue University, New West Genetics, Colorado State, Michigan State, and UW-Madison. Um, I would like to point out that if you look at the 2020 uh, results from the Midwestern Hemp Database, we have a list of some of the most commonly used varieties uh, across the four states involved in the program. Uh, all that information is available on the website, but this just gives you a brief idea of some of the information that's available there. Um, as we spoke about the differences between photoperiod dependent and auto flowering varieties, um, in the top image, uh, a race of cannabis sativa photoperiod photoperiodically adapted to a longer southern, southern season would come into flower very late when grown in a shorter no, northern season. Um, conversely, if you have a race of cannabis sativa that's been photoperiodically adapted to a shorter northern season, um, it would come into flower very early when grown in a long southern season. When thinking about our photoperiodic varieties, we have to think about it in terms of how soybeans are performing um, with their relative maturity ratings. Very similar. Um, to hemp, uh, just not as dialed in with those uh, relative maturities. Uh, 
Importantly, the longer these types of hemp plants are in the field prior to flowering, the larger they're going to get. Again, similar to soybeans, which is very important uh, for management practices and how big these plants are going to get and if you can actually manage the size of them uh, throughout the growing season in terms of lodging, uh, disease, those types of things, and also for drying and uh, harvest at the end of the season. I briefly wanted to focus um, here too on uh, differences between auto flower uh, and full season varieties. Um, so these auto flower varieties are gonna reach maturity after a certain number of days. Uh, growers are currently experimenting with both early and late planted auto flower varieties to stagger uh, production and harvest schedules. Uh, but there's li limited information regarding variety performance of both auto flower and full season varieties. And most of the varieties on the market are what we would be considered photoperiodic or photoperiod dependent and may be commonly classified as full season varieties. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have a, a good look at both auto flower and full, si full season varieties planted in the same fields. And so we're gonna take a closer look at the timing and development of both of these varieties. Um, so for example, here, uh, the auto flower on the left and the full season on the right, both of these fields uh, were planted on the same day. Um, and what we can see here is that the auto flowers are gonna be uh, inducing flowering after a set number of days. They're typically gonna be planted at narrower rower spacing to account for higher plant populations because these auto flowering varieties are gonna be shorter, more compact. Um, with that becomes reduced yield potential. And again, we need more information about this, but the unique characteristics about this is it allows some more flexibility in planting and harvest schedules if you know when these plants are gonna harvest or gonna be mature and ready for harvest. Conversely, on the right side, uh, full season varieties are often highly variable in their phenotypic expression. And we often see a great deal of variation in photoperiod dependent plants. Um, again, uh, increased row spacing in these types of populations due to the um, lower plant populations, but greater, larger branching of these plants, which again can influence yield potential, uh, but these will typically be a uh, harvested later in the season, uh, late September, early October, and we're going to talk more about that soon. So just the differences here when looking at, you know, the flowering uh, and vegetative state. If we look here, this is, these were, um, you know, about six weeks into growth of these plants, and here we are near harvest um, uh, for the autoflower varieties on the left, August 10th. Meanwhile, the full season varieties have yet to even begin to get into flowering. Um, so just again, big differences in how these plants are going to be planted and harvested uh, based off of their morphology and uh, growth cycles. Uh, when sourcing your seeds or transplants, it's important to understand that not all varieties are created equal. Uh, the market is currently saturated with varieties of the same name being sold by different companies. Uh, the reality is that most of these plants are similar on uh, name alone. As illustrated from a study out of Colorado with New West Genetics, um, and Colorado State University, we can see that there are two varieties of cherry blossom uh, being sold by different competitors. While their average THC levels are similar and their days to flower are very similar, we see that there are substantial differences in production of CBD. While this is a small study, it illustrates a very important point that until seed certification can catch up to the industry, you have to be wary about where you're getting your genetics. Uh, these issues represent some of those core ideas behind the development of the Midwestern Hemp Database as we try to provide answers to our growers. And I will illustrate too that this type of information again is available on our website um, at our hemp database and you can see this type of, um, these type of results for yourself. With, the with regards to field selection and preparation, field selection is one of the most important factors in hemp production as well. Uh, hemp likes light textured, well-drained soils, and given that there are currently no pesticides approved for industrial hemp production, planting in the field with a low history of weed production and disease pressure will be very important. Uh, weed pressure and disease control have proven to be very challenging aspects of hemp production in Illinois, so cultural practices and prevention will be your best control. Uh, lastly, I would like to draw attention to heavy metals. Uh, hemp is a phytoremediator and will take up what is in the soil. Um, so heavy metal contamination is difficult to remediate from crude oil and can make a sale of some of these materials invalid after harvest. As always, get your soil tested before planting a high value crop, especially one with these unique phytoremediation abilities. Seeding methods will vary according to production system, equipment, and harvest strategy. 
but a typical planting season is expected to begin around late May with transplants going in as late as early July and having shown to produce productive fields. Uh, based on responses from over a, uh, based on over 150 responses, uh, data from the Midwestern Hemp Database showed that a majority of the varieties were transplanted from seed, followed by transplants from clones and direct seeding. Whether you are planting from seed or transplant, it's important to plan ahead regarding target population and row spacing, which are extremely variable. Uh, row spacing typically ranges from three to six feet, with plant populations ranging from 1,000 to 3,000 plants per acre as demonstrated by the results here. Uh, plants too close together can cause issues later in the season with regards to disease, yield, and quality, while planting too far apart might make weed control a challenge. Uh, for these reasons, it's important to consider the interplay between variety, row spacing, and plant population. A majority of the planting done by the growers participating in the study occurred in uh, the planting or transplanting occurred in the beginning of June, in the first two weeks of June, or um, some of the earlier planting varieties were done via transplants and some of the later planting varieties were typically uh, going to be seen in some of the auto flowering uh, varieties with some of the growers experimenting with late season planting. Research shown out of North Carolina State University has shown that as you increase plant spacing, plant yield will increase. Uh, in addition, preliminary studies show that delaying planting will result in decreased yields. Now, neither of these results are typically surprising, but it's nice to see some concrete evidence illustrating these impacts of production. So again, it's important to think about when we're planting, when we're planting these, what row spacing is being used, and how it's going to impact the size and final uh, harvest strategy for these plants. Despite the fact that hemp is typically considered a specialized crop, we saw a lot of interest in direct seeding in 2019 and 2020. Uh, this was a combination of research and farmer ingenuity to make this work with both some success, uh, tremendous successes um, and some failures. Equipment calibration, field conditions, and seed quality are going to play a tremendous role in getting a good stand. And with seed being so expensive, it will be worth taking the time to prepare. Hemp should be planted into a well-prepared seed bed with low reed pressure. If direct seeding hemp should be planted shallow, paying attention to forecasts, as the heavy rain can cause soils to crust significantly, redu reducing uh, vigor. When using the direct seeding methods, a shallow planting at about a quarter inch is typically recommended to encourage the faster emergence, enhanced weed competition, and resist, uh, reduce issues with crusting. Uh, so weed control strategies are going to be very important, whether it be cultivation, mowing, cover crops, or some combination of them. Remember that no herbicides are labeled for industrial hemp in the state of Illinois. Transplants are started indoors or in a greenhouse uh, about four to six weeks prior to field planting. Uh, specialty growers are often more suited for this type of production and are, are often having the equipment and materials necessary to establish plants this way. Um, hemp is typically hardened off prior to planting and transplanting methods um, can be quite variable, whether that's by uh, mechanical planting or by hand. Now, what about the difference between clones and transplants? Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna delve too much into clonal propagation, but in essence, a clone is a six to 10 inch cutting grown in a process of asexual reproduction to produce exact genetic and phenotypic replicas of their mother plants. Mother plants are simply plants with favorable characteristics which you would like to replicate and continue for, for, for time to come. Clones retain genetic uniformity and consistent growth and are grown for about two to three weeks before being planted into the field. Importantly, clones do not develop tap roots and only develop lateral, lateral roots, while tap roots are more suited to grow straight down and penetrate deeper, uh, deeper into water and into the subsoil, lateral roots allow more adequate nutrient uptake and seeding into the soil uh, for a more active and adequate nutrient uptake. Naturally, there will be some trade-offs to clones versus transplants in terms of cost and quality, and that will be something that you need to consider. Unfortunately, we do not have any updates on fertility requirements for cannabinoid hemp. The only information I can share are the recommendations for grain and fiber from the University of Kentucky. Um, as always, experimentation and testing is encouraged to determine what's going to fit into your production system. While there were early concerns regarding fertilizer rates and their impact on THC accumulation, research from Cornell indicates that genetic stability and not fertility rates are the primary factor influencing THC production. 
I'll talk more about that soon. There has been some discussions regarding foiler fertilization and uh, fertigation as it pertains to disease and floral quality at the end of the season. The most valuable portions of the plant, the flower, are susceptible to insect and disease pressure, so reducing conditions which favor those pathogens, such as keeping foreign material dry, are of interest. I think by now we're quite familiar with the growth stages of the hemp plant with planting or transplanting occurring in June, followed by a slow vegetative growth stage where weed control is of primary importance. There is then a period of rapid growth which leads into flowering and reproduction. Flowering structures will occur at each node and we can see the branching morphology of the plant as it grows throughout the vegetative uh, growth cycle. We then move into a reproductive phase where sexual expression occurs and we are then able to distinguish between male and female plants. It is at this time, uh, it is at this point at which if you see male plants in your feminized fields that you are to call them and get them out of there as soon as possible. This is a reminder that any pollination of a female plant will limit its cannabinoid production and promote seed production. If you can, again, so again, if you see these male structures developing uh, in, in the field, you need to get them out of there. It is upon flowering that cannabinoids will begin to accumulate in the flowering material. Results from Rock River Laboratory have demonstrated that CBD increases curve linearly with the time with rapid accumulation of CBD occurring later in the season. This may have forced some producers to hold off harvest in an attempt to maximize profitability. Uh, so the goal will be to maximize production of your cannabinoids of choice, such as CBD or CBG, while limiting the accumulation of THC to produce a compliant crop. This study done out of Cornell University assesses the impacts of various abiotic and biotic stresses on CBD and THC ratios produced in hemp. The results of this study show that there were no significant difference in CBD to THC ratio produced by hemp plants under those stresses compared to the control. Research out of Utah State University has shown some interesting results regarding the production and then degradation of cannabinoids in the plant. What we can see is that there, throughout flowering, there is an accumulation of these cannabinoids at different proportions, but ultimately a point at which they begin to decrease in concentration. Now, whether or not that is due to degradation of these molecules or dilution of concentration, this remains to be seen. Regardless, what we are seeing is that there is going to be an optimum time to harvest these plants for those particular cannabinoids, noting that different cannabinoids will have specific peak harvest times. The Midwestern Hemp Database is a large scale private public partnership which seeks to provide clarity on variety performance and agronomic production strategies of hemp growers across the region. This project utilized over 140 grower co cooperators with participation, collaboration, and oversight from several land grant institutions and private laboratories issued here. In short, participation in this program provided hemp growers an exciting opportunity to receive discounted cannabinoid profiling in exchange for data collection and data sharing to be made available in a publicly accessible interface. Despite the variation due to state rules and regulations and a lack of standardized sample collection and analytical protocols, the data generated from this project has provided a much needed baseline to guide further hemp research. Uh, the interactive data visualization tool is available now at go.illinois.edu slash hemp database. As of now, there are over 169 distinct variety source entries representing over 800 tissue samples for cannabinoid analysis. And we're gonna run through some of those results right now. So in total, 801 samples were submitted with 456 of the samples, so 57% being submitted during the September 14th through October 15th window. And this illustrates the peak sampling period we can see commencing during flowering. 25% uh, of the samples tested above 0.3% total THC and 47 of the samples tested above the current 0.5% total THC negligence threshold. Again, illustrating that source of genetics is going to be very important uh, in producing a, comp a compliant crop. When looking at the data as a whole, there is a clear near linear or curve linear relationship being exhibited between CBD and THC for a majority of the varieties entered into the database. Aside from several unstable variety sources and high CBG varieties, what this tells us is that there will likely be a limit in the ability of varieties to reach very high CBD percentages without exceeding the maximum THC limit for compliant hemp crops. 
In other words, hemp producers will likely be looking for hemp varieties with a stable CBD to THC ratio of between 20 and 30 to maximize profitability while maintaining compliance. These results have been supported by work done by Cornell University looking at the CBD production, a CBD to THC ratio of some popular commercially available cultivars, many of which are listed in our Midwestern Hemp database. Interestingly enough as well, research out of Cornell also indicates that stable cultivars will not exhibit changes in CBD to THC ratio despite differences in locations and stressors. For growers, this means that working with reliable seed suppliers with a history of stable genetics is going to be more important than production system or fertility regimen when it comes to producing a compliant crop, not necessarily discussing uh, yields. All this information is again available on our website and can be modified using filters to select the desired information. Um, so we also have information on total CBD, CBG, and all various other cannabinoids from each of these uh, nearly, eight, uh, nearly 800 samples, and it's all available online. This program will be continued in 2021 and will be used to guide more intensive variety trials moving forward. Um, keep an eye out for that information, which will be available on the database website uh, when we have more information. Crop diseases can occur at a variety of locations on the hemp plant, ranging from the flower all the way down to the roots. While we have observed some diseases and pests in the past year, it's still, past two years, it's still too early to, to determine which are economically significant for hemp. Uh, when considering plant diseases, it's important to consider the disease triangle, um, noting that we must always have all three things for a disease to occur, a susceptible plant host, a pathogen and an environmental condition that favors the host and pathogen to allow disease development. Understanding these principles will make disease identification much easier in the future. Uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison released a field-grown hemp insect and pest guide, which is available online. The guide provides visual aids as well as potential solutions for these issues. Additionally, work done by Whitney Crenshaw out of Colorado State University will provide a fantastic resource in pest and disease management. It's important to note that there are currently no insecticides or pesticides labeled for industrial hemp, making control essentially limited to cultural practices and preventative measures. Additionally, we are not certain which pests are of economic importance, but current uh, early season foliar diseases of interest include uh, Septoria leaf spot, characterized by black specks within circular or angular lesions, and is pictured here along with other foliar diseases such as circle sporal leaf spot or hemp leaf spot and wilt such as fusarium, pythium, or verticillum. These diseases appear as early as June but usually become more widespread into July and into August. Primary concerns during flowering include white mold and gray mold. These symptoms the symptoms of these diseases are similar to those that we find in other crops when they are affected by their pathogens and typically show up later during the flowering period. You can find all sorts of insects in a hemp field, but by far the most calls or emails I received last year were due to pests such as the corn earworm, corn rootworm, and, and also their Eurasian hemp borer pictured here. The Eurasian hemp borer will burrow, burrow into the floral structure, causing damage and opening the bud to other pests and diseases. When it comes to post-harvest testing, we saw some interesting results in 2019. Uh, these results shared from Rock River Laboratory, one of our partners on the Midwestern Hemp Database, showed that samples continually tested significantly above safety thresholds for aerobic plate, count, aerobic plate counts and total mold and yeast counts. As you can see, the safe limits are shown by the orange lines, which had to be zoomed in to actually see. This is of concern for producers looking to sell smokable flour and consumers who are looking to consume it. Due to the limits on pesticide application, this is once again an area where cultural practices may be a factor. Moving on to heavy metal testing, results show that some samples tested above safety thresholds for lead, arsenic, and cadmium. While this may be a concern for some more than it is others, it is something that has popped up on the news here and there, forcing products to be recalled. Once again, this is a stat when a once again, when establishing a specialty crop with such high input costs, getting the soil test may be a good option. Importantly, in uh, extraction protocols, uh, things such as uh, microbes and most in, mold and yeast counts may be able to be remediated via extraction. Heavy metals are much, uh, much more difficult to remediate. 
I would now like to take a few minutes to talk about compliance testing. Certificates of analysis are issued and provide proof that your hemp tests below the threshold of 0.3% THC in the state of Illinois. The four state approved laboratories are listed on this slide. I would like to point out to you that you are allowed to send samples out of state for analysis, but keep in mind that sample collection, preparation, and analytical method may be different from state to state and lab to lab. For the sake of time, I will not be going over the rules and regulations, but growers and processors will need to know the ins and outs of them before getting involved in hemp production and can find all of this information via the Illinois Department of Agriculture and their website. Regarding harvest, um, once you've received a certificate of analysis showing that you have a compliant crop, you are allowed to harvest it from the field via the Midwestern Hemp Database of the 152 variety locations, 84 were harvested over a 20 day period from October 1st to October 20th. This is what we would have expected after the 2019 growing season and variation in harvesting dates uh, were due to hot crops, earlier flowering varieties and staggered auto flower plantings. But what's really important here is again, is there's going to be a time crunch uh, to get these crops out of the field and to ensure compliance. And if we think about how this overlaps with our sampling date, there is going to be a two week sampling crunch followed by a two week harvest crunch uh, to really get these crops out of the field. We saw a variety of harvesting methods depending on the production system in place. These photos courtesy of American Hemp Research out of Roseville show them harvesting some plants by hand using a chainsaw and being loaded onto the back of a trailer to be hauled for drying. We also saw hemp using, being harvested using a variety of machinery including, including rotary heads as seen on the picture on the left or a stripper head. The biomass was then transferred from a combine to a wagon where air was forced on it to get it down to acceptable moisture. Again, thinking about how these plants are being harvested for their end use. Regardless of how you harvest it, hemp will need to be dried quickly and efficiently to prevent spoilage. Whole plants when harvested typically come in above 70% moisture and storage recommendations are about 10% moisture. It can be difficult to re remove that amount of moisture in October in Illinois when it's cool and damp. In many cases, additional fans and dehumidifiers were brought in to bring the moisture down. Attention should be paid to the drying temperatures as high heat can cause the decarboxylation of THCA into Delta-9 THC and may impact testing values. A variety of methods were used to store hemp after effectively drying, including fiber drums, polyurethane bags, and super sacks. Super sacks seem to be the most common among growers and were they were easily available and efficient for storing in, and transportation. Polyurethane bags were also used uh, due to their availability uh, and price. However, uh, some concerns over condensation forced producers to dry down material a little more than normal to prevent that from occurring and uh, uh, potentially causing spoilage. One thing I would like to point out that we're not gonna spend too much time on is the drying, trimming, and curing process for high quality flour. For growers looking to grow higher quality flour for smokable or for extraction, they need to consider post-harvest processing. This is not as easy as simply hanging, drying, and storing the plants, but a whole other process of slowly drying, trimming these materials, and keeping them in storage to maximize their quality. Um, for those of you who are interested in drying, trimming, and curing, there is not a lot of information about this uh, from university published resources, and so we're going to kind of skip over it today. Uh, but I want you to be aware of these types of processes for those who are looking to get into higher quality flour and understanding the laborious and time-consuming process that is trimming and curing uh, cannabis. Any grower will tell you the same thing. But I think it's important to really understand the base terms uh, and what they mean. So crude oil, for example, is extracted from the plant and contains all cannabinoids, terpenes, and other plant compounds. This is a raw, crude form of the hemp oil. This material can then be further refined through distillation to produce both broad or full spectrum distillate and can be refined even further into isolate, which is a removal of all plant compounds except for the desired product, in many cases, CBD. 
Recently, the Illinois Department of Agriculture released a notification enabling cannabis cultivation centers to use industrial hemp as an ingredient in cannabis-infused products offered for sale at licensed dispensaries in Illinois. Importantly, however, hemp flour may not be sold to dispensaries, as all hemp obtained through this policy may be used in ex extracted form and only in infused cannabis products. This is a new supply chain, and while there are some kinks to be worked out, it is definitely a progressive move for Illinois. The Illinois pilot program states that you are responsible to purchase, grow, process, and sell materials which test below 0.3% Delta 9 THC threshold and has been extended through the 2021 growing season. At that time, the state of Illinois will issue new guidance as it pertains to the future of the industrial hemp program and the rules and regulations surrounding it. So in summary, CBD production is going to be typically labor intensive. Field selection is incredibly important, whether it's well-drained soils, good seedbed preparation, and using highly productive fields with low weed pressure. You wanna really consider your post-harvest strategies because they're almost as important, if not more important, than your actual planting strategy. And that is to how you're going to dry, store, and where you're going to get this material extracted. And ultimately, too, what is the end product, smokable flour or biomass for processing and extraction as the end use is ultimately also going to dictate how you are planting and harvesting this material. I would now like to briefly discuss the results of the hemp grain and fiber trials that were conducted at the University of Illinois uh, at Urbana in 2020. The first field study evaluated the response of five hemp fiber cultivars to three seeding rates, while the second study evaluated the agronomic performance of four grain hemp cultivars. Germination tests on all seed lots allowed adjustment of seeding rate to achieve a comparable pure live seed density in all plots. I'd like to point out that the full trial results are available at our variety trial website, uh, which is listed here. Economic traits to be evaluated included germination rate, flowering date, plant height, biomass yield, and grain yield. And here is a picture of the grain hemp plots during grain development, courtesy of Alan Parrish on campus. The 2020 industrial hemp growing season in Illinois had a slow start. Early spring rains prevented a May planting and a flooding event on June 3rd resulted in the trial being replanted on June 15th. After replanting, weather conditions improved and were favorable for the rest of the growing season. Planting depth was approximately uh, a half to three quarter inches and fertilizer rates were based on recommendations from the University of Kentucky to be applied at planting. After flowering, samples were taken to evaluate THC content of each variety to ensure that they fell below the legal limit of 0.3% THC and were deemed compliant. The fiber trial was harvested on August 31st and the grain trial was harvested on September 17th. Grain was harvested when the seed heads contained 75% moisture seed, 75% brown mature seed to reduce potential losses from seed chatter. Until further data is collected and more statistical analysis can be performed, be performed, data reported is in terms of averages across replications for each treatment. Seed density and standard germ percent was highly variable across seed varieties. For nearly for all varieties, flowering initiation began in either late July or early August, with flowering initiation periods occurring approximately seven days from 10% flowering to 90% flowering across the plots. Plant height was variable according to hemp type and variety, with plant heights ranging from 58.3 to 85 inches among fiber varieties and plant heights ranging from about 32 inches to 61.2 inches among grain varieties. From the fiber trial results, we saw that as seeding rate increased, plant density and yield also increased, and that plant density was highly variable across varieties, uh, likely due to seed quality issues. Biomass yield of fiber varieties was variable among hemp varieties and seeding rates and range from 20, approximately 2,500 to 5,700 pounds per acre, uh, depending on the variety being used. Moving on to the grain trial, uh, most importantly, grain yields range from 741 to 1,156.4 pounds per acre. 
depending on variety. These numbers are what we would expect to see um, out of grain from the University of Kentucky. Moving on to the discussion about the trial, 2020 had a slow start, but conditions became favorable later on in the season. Uh, pest pressure and no major diseases were observed throughout the growing season. Uh, but seed quality is all over the board for the fiber and grain varieties, at least that were issued in this trial. No entry achieved the target population two weeks after planting for grain and fiber. Um, this will have to improve as seed certification standards and established companies emerge, but there is a need to further assess how seed weights and germinations are going to result in stand quality and yield in variety trials. Variety, photoperiosity, site, suitability, and end use. Uh, and the interactions of these factors will have a strong impact on crop productivity and suitability for post-harvest use. Uh, in addition, the harvest and processing technologies are needed, that are needed to optimize the plant's value are limited or lacking in the United States. And although full of promise given its numerous potential benefits and uses, building markets for these products will be, critical, part, will be a critical part of hemp's development into a useful agronomic crop for hemp growers. All the resources discussed here today are available at our various websites listed here, uh, but with particular interest going to our hemp, uh, our University of Illinois hemp web pages, which have the results of the variety trials, as well as the Midwestern hemp database page. Um, lastly, uh, our, our other webpage, go.illinois.edu slash hemp, is where you're going to find all the information that was shared here today and links to various universities and their hemp production resources. Additionally, both the Illinois Hemp Growers Association and Illinois Stewardship Alliance are great partners and provide a lot of information and assistance uh, to hemp growers in the state of Illinois. And I would encourage you to reach out to them to see what resources they have available. Special thanks go out to all of our university collaborators who made this research possible. Uh, Alan Parrish, DK Lee, Darren Jost for the research at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, our private sponsors, New West Genetics Legacy Hemp, and Revolution Global, who helped supplied the resources uh, to make the grain and fiber trials possible. And lastly, to the Midwestern Hemp Database team, Shelby Ellison, James Dedeker, Marguerite Bolt, and then Dustin Sawyer and Scott Fleming from Rock River Laboratories for making our Midwestern Hemp Database project possible. Please reach out to me anytime with any questions that you may have. I would be glad to answer them. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.